All right, so today we're going to be talking about the evolution of harmony in classical music. Now, the harmony that classical music has gone through in the last, I don't know, maybe 500 years has been quite distinct, and with most forms of anything, uh, it tends to accelerate the further it gets along, similar to like technology. Uh, we keep coming up with innovations sooner than we used to. And in the same way, our approaches to music change, and harmony is probably the most crucial of those. Now, uh, back in the Baroque period, if we take a look at composers like Bach or Handel or Vivaldi, <laughs> We can see that their harmony is, uh, I mean, you have to think about where it stems from. It's stemming from vocal music and the need to lift up a deity. So you want to keep it relatively pleasing, especially considering the audience. Um, things like Catholic masses or just generally sacred music. Um, it's for a wide audience with not everyone really ready to hear uh, anything nasty per se. Uh, you think about the common rumor of the tritone being banned uh, in the Baroque period. Uh, while there's some debate on whether or not that's true, uh, it makes sense saying that even if you go and study the theory in a basic level class in college, the first thing they'll tell you is uh, no one seven chords. No, you know, your only seventh chord is going to be a dominant seventh chord and definitely no major seven chords. Those are, those are bad. But you take a look nowadays, especially in things like jazz or even pop music, seventh chords are used uh, predominantly. Uh, if we take a look at the end of Stravinsky's Symphonies of Wind Instruments, we hear he ends on a, uh, on a seventh chord, a C major seventh chord. And this can be a bit apprehensive for people who aren't well trained in classical music. I found that when showing classical music to people who aren't very well versed in it, uh, the more abstract harmonies can not be as pleasing. And I think this is the big crux of getting classical music to people who want to hear it while also giving them a wide variety of music to listen to. Uh, if you were to show someone who isn't well versed in classical music the right of spring, they'd be like, what the heck is this? This just sounds like garbage, especially uh, when the orchestration gets really dense. You start looking at these huge chords and you start seeing the abolition of chords and harmony as our way of dividing music. Uh, because it used to be that, you know, melody and harmony were the main ways of driving forward music. If you study any sort of common practice period music, uh, especially towards the Baroque period, in a theory class, uh, you know, they'll teach you kind of uh, harmonic progression and harmonic retrogression and how you can use chords to uh, create movement within a piece. Uh, you know, the only other way you could really add movement was maybe by making the tempo faster. That would make it drive along. But, you know, back then it was all about harmony. And as we got into more recent music, we see that harmony becomes sort of abolished, uh, especially if you look at any of Stravinsky's ballets, uh, especially if you try to look at Petrushka. Or The Rite of Spring, uh, 
analyzing it functionally is not only hard, but sometimes it's not even worth your time. And that's not a bad thing because you have to realize that what Stravinsky and many other of the modern composers are trying to get at is a feeling because as music was being phased out of the church and starting to be used for personal use, uh, music was created to create feelings. And you see this now in pop music, you know, it's uh, people trying to show their feelings in the best way that will get to the most amount of people possible. And I think that's the crux of what music is. So if you start looking at the Rite of Spring, especially if you do some music history, you know, the title page is pretty fitting. This is what it's trying to represent, is some kind of primitive, you know, dance. It's a pagan ritual, and the music fits that very well, uh, especially if you, you know, if you look at any of his other stuff, or if you look at, uh, you know, like, Shostakovich. They're kind of throwing harmony out the door in order to receive an effect. And this is something that Stravinsky was really pioneering, was not only creating abstract harmonies to create tension and resolution, because, you know, this is how kind of more complex harmonies started, was like the dominant seventh chord. It's meant to create tension and then release to the tonic chord. And as you get further along, harmonies, you know, when you start adding a bunch of accidentals and start adding a bunch of chord extensions, it becomes less about tension and resolution and more about uh, feeling and a texture. And especially in the Rite of Spring, which is one of my favorites, we get to the point where, uh, you know, obviously it's very earthy because that's what it's supposed to be about, but you get to the point where it, uh, it just kind of makes a feeling, especially, uh, you know, the very beginning where you have all these little almost animal sounds happening at once to kind of simulate the coming of spring and the morning and all the different instruments. So, you know, harmony is not taking the same precedent that it used to. And suddenly now rhythm is really important. The most uh, amazing example of that that I can think of uh, is in the Rite of Spring. It's this example right here. very well known. Uh, you see all kinds of crazy musicians turning it into rock covers and jazz covers, but really at this point the harmony is irrelevant. If you look at the harmony, uh, you can see that it's kind of just uh, two chords that are a minor second apart, just spaced out a lot. You can see that on the score right here. And it's to a point where analyzing it functionally uh, you get about the same answer you do just from listening to it. Like, wow, that's kind of crunchy and uh, kind of out there. But you understand that the point is this is a this is a very driving section. Each one of those accents is just like a, a strike to the chest. So in this way, you know, harmony is irrelevant. At this point, Stravinsky is using harmony for sound effects, uh, not necessarily to please the ear in the traditional sense. And if we look even further, we get into things like serialism. Uh, kind of after the second Viennese school with Schoenberg, we start seeing the rising of 12-tone rows. And when the 12-tone row comes in, which for those who aren't aware, uh, you just set up a row of notes, it's 12 notes, 
and uh, you're you're using each note from the chromatic scale. Uh, and the point of this is that you're using each note the same amount of time as any others and uh, the same number of times as any other. So now we're getting to atonal music where no sort of pitch has any more precedent than any other one. And with atonal music, obviously as the name would imply, tonality is out the door. It's not about tonality anymore. And uh, you know, if we look at like obviously Pierre Boulez uh, and his second piano sonata, even if we listen to the very beginning, we hear that there, there is no harmony necessarily in the traditional sense. Uh, and if you really listen to this piece, which is hard to do, but worth it, especially to sit through the entire thing, you hear that the it's just a whole new approach to music, especially with the historical significance of serialism and uh, Boulez's take on harmony. You see that he's just kind of throwing it out the door to create a whole new perception of music. You know, uh, people like Wagner, who used a lot of motifs, uh, these were, you know, both rhythmic and, uh, you know, notes that created a motif. But now, you still have motifs in this serialist music, but it's to the point where they don't always happen at the same time. So you might have a rhythmic motif, uh, say at the beginning, there's uh, four 16th notes that keep getting repeated all the time. But they're hardly ever any of the same notes because this is not the point because these things are almost so random that they don't coincide together. So you're getting to the point where harmony doesn't even mean anything. It's to the point similar to like what Stravinsky was trying to do in The Rite of Spring or Petrushka is to create a feeling and a texture, you know, especially when you get to these dense moments of orchestration, uh, again, in places like The Rite of Spring. a point where uh, you know it just gives you a gut feeling it's just very it's very crunchy and evil and lurking and in the same way when we have these serialist composers which is kind of the height of uh, atonal music and throwing a harmony out the door you see that they're trying to do the same thing so now if we look all the way back it used to be that harmony was our way of creating forward motion and uh, variance in the pieces. Uh, looking forward, that kind of stays the same until we get to things like serialism and modern day compositions where now you can't just use the same little motif over and over because of the, uh, the way in which serialist pieces are made with 12 tone rows and things like that. Uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be a complete 12 tone row, but you're getting to the point where it's not really going to be a repeating motif anymore. So now you have identifying factors rather than it being motifs, it's like a specific texture. So if we, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the Boulez piano sonata, it's just, uh, it's this very specific texture, but at the same time, it's very abstract. And if you listen to the whole piece, which has several movements, you'll hear a very distinct difference uh, in the type of texture that's being given. And in this way, this is our way of creating variance. And now we are kind of to the crux of, uh, or rather the height of harmony, which is to say harmony in the traditional sense doesn't even work anymore. And this can be challenging because especially if you want to show someone a modern piece, it's very hard because you'll find yourself having to kind of 
carefully pick out the right piece to show people so that it's not too hard on the ears because even for musicians these pieces are not going to be the same you know Boulez's piano sonata number two is not going to be the same as Rachmaninoff's piano concerto number two Even when you have dissonance in Rachmaninoff, it's not the same. Uh, if you think about something like a Bach chorale or a harpsichord concerto by Bach, it's not the same. As uh, this more modern music, so at least for me, it's hard to lie and say that this is the most beautiful piece of music I've ever heard because it's a very different approach. Uh, in these pieces of music, it's the journey that they take you on and especially the music that goes behind that, the theory and things like that, that is what fuels a musician inside and makes them content with a piece. So I think it's important to understand how harmony develops so that you understand uh, when you're getting to a point where some people aren't going to like it nearly as much because, you know, for a lot of people, Boulez's second piano sonata is just going to be totally unbearable for more than maybe two minutes and they'll just rip all their hair out. So with that said, that's the end of this video. Uh, I hope you'll enjoyed and I'll see you in the next.